There was a husband who wanted a divorce from his wife. One day he finally mustered up the courage to tell her that a week from that day he'll be coming to hand to her the divorce papers at that very hour. The wife in response tells him that as soon as she sees those divorce papers, she's going to cut them into pieces with the chainsaw and she won't stop at the papers. <laughs> the next week, after waiting every day in her now empty home with the newly bought chainsaw, probably <laughs> still, hopefully still, no. the woman hears a knock at the door. She flings the door open, chainsaw revving, and a sweet group of girls yell and run and scream, leaving behind all the dozy do -si Samoas, and Thin Mints. <laughs> Attached to the wagon that they left was a note that says, I'll sleep on the couch. That went over your head, sorry. I expected to laugh. He changed his mind. Oh. <laughs> changed his mind. We're continuing today in our calling series. We're going to be looking at Jeremiah's call. We've covered so many calls. We've covered Esther, whose call we can look to and see that God doesn't always have to tell us from the heavens that we have a call from him. Sometimes he speaks in our hearts. Sometimes our hearts break for certain things. And that's a call from God. But today we're going to be looking at Jeremiah. Have you ever been the person who's had to tell someone some bad news that would negatively affect them? It's not a fun thing to be that person. Not at all. Most of the time, when you tell someone bad news that is negatively affecting them, they treat you as if you're the one causing them to have to face whatever it is that's negative. The call God gave to Jeremiah was just that. He was going to be sent to Israel and to the nations of the world to tell some bad news that was going to really rub them the wrong way. He had to give a lot of bad news. And a lot of people weren't happy with Jeremiah. So today we're going to look at two things. The first is why Jeremiah was called. And the second is his reaction to his call. Is that on So, looking into the first, why was Jeremiah called? Back with Moses, we see that God has set Israel apart as his people and will make a very specific covenant with them. In that covenant, God reveals to Israel the famous phraseology that they could receive either blessings or cursings for either their obedience or disobedience to the law. He gave them the law through Moses. For what can be argued to be roughly around 1,000 years since Moses led them out of captivity and gave to them the law, Israel as a whole, for this 1,000 years roughly, can be argued, they were leaning heavily toward receiving cursings because of their disobedience. And it was near time to pay up. Jeremiah was called to tell them of this. Jeremiah was called during the time in the reign of King Josiah, which, him being my namesake, not, not, not the only reason. This is an interesting, an interesting uh, fact to look into. Jeremiah's call ultimately brought with it the warning and the fruition of Jerusalem receiving God's wrath 
for disobedience. Yet Jeremiah's life as a prophet overlaps Josiah's reign as king of Judah. Josiah destroyed all the places of idol worship and also all the high places of worship. If you were in the lesson this morning, Matt was getting into that. And he restored Israel to worshiping God fully in accordance to what the law demanded. And Matt made a good point. This might not have been the, the most glorious worship, and I, we don't know, I'm not getting into that, but it was them fully turning back. Them fully turning back in repentance to the Lord. But I see that there's a, a message given from God with both Josiah and Jeremiah coming at the same time. As if God through Josiah and Jeremiah said to the Israel, Israelites, you're about to receive punishment because you haven't been worshiping like this. For a short time, they were turned back to worshiping properly. But for almost a thousand years, they've been failing to do so. We see the first prophecy that God gave to Jeremiah was to go and tell Jerusalem that they have done two major wrongs to God. One, they forsook God. They left from him and his ways. But they didn't stop there. They exchanged the glory of the living God for lifeless idols. They chose other gods. <coughs> Sorry. I got to figure out these slides. They throws me off a bit. <laughs> if you would, turn with me to Jeremiah 2, 9 through 13. It'll be up on the screen for you as well. Okay. All right. All right. Beginning in verse 9, it reads, Therefore, once more, I accuse you, says the Lord, and I accuse your children's children's children. Cross to the coast of Cyprus and look. Send the keter and examine with care. See if there has ever been such a thing. Has a nation changed its gods, even though they are no gods? But my people have changed their glory for something that does not profit. Be appalled, O, o heavens, at this. Be shocked, be utterly desolate, says the Lord. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living water, and dug out cisterns excuse me, for themselves, cracked cisterns that can hold no water. Mm. Imagine being told that kind of news. That was what Jeremiah was first told to go and tell Israel. Imagine having to go and tell Israel this, and then imagine being Israel having to hear those words from God. We know us, and the Israelites are no different from how we react to bad news and being told when we're doing things we ought not do. We get defensive. We seek to justify ourselves. We seek to justify our actions. We hardly will ever admit our wrong, and we barely own up to it. It's who we are, and it's who Israel was. We can look at the Israelites and wonder why or how they could do such a thing, but how many of us truly trust in the blood of Jesus? I don't say that to condemn. But even if we first come to Christ, our faith doesn't stop there. And it's more than just now trying to be a good person. It's about seeking to love each other as Jesus loves. But by that love, they will know we are his disciples. That's what our Lord said. They will know you are my disciples. 
because you love each other as I have loved you. But that love isn't accomplished by our willing to do it. That love is accomplished by God. When we pick up our cross daily, denying our wills and following after Jesus. But if we don't place ourselves into the yoke with Jesus, and this is what I mean, do we truly trust in Jesus? Or are we trying to do things on our own? If we don't place ourselves into the yoke with Jesus, however will the burden be light? He tells us, mm -hmm. take my yoke upon you, for my burden is light. But that burden is only light because we have Jesus connected to us to help carry it. Amen. And when you have Jesus working alongside of you, carrying a burden, it's going to feel light. Mm -hmm. But if you don't, it's going to be heavy. If we don't place ourselves into the yoke with Jesus, how would the burden be light? But better yet, will we even want to pick it up? Or will we make excuse like Jeremiah initially did? Which brings us to our second point. How Jeremiah reacts to his call. Read with me, if you would, Jeremiah 1, 4 through 8. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, Ah, Lord God, truly, I do not know how to speak, for I am only a boy. But the Lord said to me, Do not say, I am only a boy. For you shall go to all to whom I send you, and you shall speak whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Jeremiah was young when God called him. He was sent out by God even being just a boy. And that's one of his reactions to God. It's one of his first disagreements almost with God. And we see it today too. We're all of varying ages when we're referring to our earthly years. I'm a young man and there's some in here that are older and there's some in here that are younger. But many of us feel as if we're too young spiritually to answer what God has called us to do. Many of us say the same thing that Jeremiah said to God when referring to us spiritually. How many of us think we don't know what to say or what to do or how to act because we're just too young spiritually? We're called as Christians to stand out. We're called as Christians to tell of the good news of the Lord Jesus. But how many of us feel as if we're unfit and unready to do so because of how new we are to Christianity? How many of us have been in the Lord for many years and still feel as if we're not mature enough? It's true, we're not all evangelists. We're not all called to be evangelists. But we're all called into a relationship with the Lord. We're all called to trust that he who has started something good in us will see it through to completion. What did the Lord say to Jeremiah? Do not say, I am only a boy, because I am with you. Do not be afraid, because I will deliver you. Do you know that in you? Do you know that in you? Right now, if you're in the Lord, do you know that in you lives God? Mm -hmm. Do you know what that means? Do you know that you are the temple now of the living God? That's so wonderful. That's so humbling. 
That's so beautiful. And that's so encouraging. How have I become the temple of the living God? Because God has told me in Ezekiel chapter 36 that he will place his spirit within me. Here we can read, I will sprinkle clean water upon you and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness. And from all your idols I will cleanse you. A new heart I will give you and a new spirit I will put within you and I will remove your, from your body the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and make you follow my statutes and be careful to observe my ordinances. When Peter tells us that we will receive the Holy Spirit by repenting and being baptized, I, I can speak for myself. I trust in God's faithfulness to do just that. I trust that now, Holy Spirit, God, the Holy Spirit lives in me. I yield to God and he brings out the fruit of his spirit from within me that I have seen and know that it, can, that it came not from me. And I'm sure we've all experienced times where we felt strength that we knew didn't come from us. Do we truly trust in God's promises to us? Do we truly trust that God will work out the good in us? That he's the one at work in us? That he's living in us, dwelling in us. That's such a beautiful and wonderful thing. Praise God for it. <laughs> Father, we praise you. Let's praise the Lord. When we come here on Sundays, let's remember that. Let's remember that it was Jesus who went to the cross for that. God wants to use us. He calls us to be his children. Who he will shape and mold and transform who he lives in. He's close with us every step of our lives. We may just be two years, two decades, two days in the Lord, but he who lives in me, he who lives in us, is greater than he who lives in the world. Let's believe that. So, let's go to all nations, wherever our feet stand, and give praise to our King our Lord, our Savior, our Redeemer, our beloved Jesus Christ. Let's go and shout His name. Let's stand out. Let's make it be known that we love our Lord. Let's give Him glory and praise and honor that so do Him for the wonderful things He's done for us and still does for us. Let's do that. Be empowered by the Lord. We're a body here. We're the Lord's body. Let's move as His body to be empowered by Him, trust in Him. Let's work together as one in the Spirit. God the Son of God the Father has secured for me, for us, God the Holy Spirit. And God the Holy Spirit, because of Jesus, submits himself eagerly to be sent into the saints of the church to fill us, to renew us, and to transform us further into the glory of the Lord. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> but there's a question. That we all ask, especially when we're at that point, when our lives are surrendered, when we're saying, God, I'm yours to use. We see that with that life, with that surrender, comes a lot of heartache, a lot of hard times, a lot of persecution. Why do the righteous suffer and the wicked prosper? God in his infinite wisdom has allowed humanity to be led into the captivity of Satan only to be made his triumphant, glorious children shining forth in this dark world as a proclamation that he is great. 
He is awe-inspiring. And he is magnificent. He took us in our fallen state and has caused us to surpass the original state that we were created in. And we will live there as his children, fully, with our new heavenly bodies, glorious, because of his goodness. Even though we're broken, look at how he can heal us. That's our great God. That's who we're here praising today. That's who we're here worshiping today. That's who loves us. He calls us his children. God told Jeremiah he would strengthen him. And learning of the life that Jeremiah lived, you see how much God's strengthening would be needed in order to endure and do the things that God, that God called Jeremiah to do. It's hard things that God had called Jeremiah to do. Can you imagine having to go and give to the nation of Israel prophecy that unless they repent, today in the lesson, Matt had a scripture read that said the people of Israel loved the way they were living. Even though it was in disobedience, they loved it. Now imagine having to go to these people who love living wrong and telling them, unless you stop, God will bring his wrath upon you. It's near. That takes a lot of courage. And don't think for a second that Jeremiah was strengthened by his own strength. God gave him the strength. And God gives us the strength today in our world when we when we go and proclaim the gospel of our Lord Jesus, when we speak to our brothers and our sisters, when it takes the courage to let them know that we see something that we want to talk with them about and get to the bottom of it. Because we want to glorify God with our lives. And we'll need strength from God to do that. We need wisdom from God to do that. I want us to read Jeremiah 12, 1 through 3. Because it always comes up. Why do the righteous suffer and the wicked prosper? You will be in the right, O Lord. This is Jeremiah. You will be in the right, O Lord, when I lay charges against you. We ought to have this same conversation. But we ought to have the same view when having this conversation with God. You, God, will be in the right, but we still want to know. We still are hurt by seeing the righteous suffer and the wicked prosper. But you'll be in the right when I lay these charges against you. But let me put my case to you. Why does the way of the guilty prosper? Why do all who are treacherous thrive? You plant them and they take root. They grow and bring forth fruit. You are near in their mouths yet far from their hearts. But you, O oh Lord, know me. You see me and test me. My heart is with you. Pull them out like sheep for the slaughter and set them apart for the day. Of slaughter. And isn't that what our, our hearts almost want when we're honest about it? When we look at this, when we look at the world and see what people do with their wealth. Even when we look at who we who we see promoting Christ, and yet their hearts are far from Him, and they're prospering. And what are they doing with the gain? And we say to God, God, take them, take them away from that, remove them from that. Why are they being blessed? 
when their heart is far from you. Look at my heart. Look at the heart of the church that I met. God, why do they have the good things of fortune and stability when they don't even care for your cause? Why do we struggle through life and when we look at our predecessors, they too face perilous times nearly their entire lives? Like Jeremiah. Why, God? Why? I want to read a quote from Martin Luther. It should be on the screen for you then. Oh, it's not. Sorry. But follow along. Well, may the prophets often extol those wonderful works of God. The passage through the Red Sea, the exodus from Egypt, and the like. For the sea, which by its nature can only devour and destroy, is forced to part and rise and protect the Israelites, lest they be overwhelmed by its tides. That which in its very nature is wrath becomes grace to the believer. That which in reality is death becomes life. Therefore, whatever calamity comes, and this life has it in infinite measure, to threaten our property and our lives, it will all become salvation and joy if we only are in the ark. That is, if by faith we lay hold of the promise made in Christ. Then even death, by which we are removed, must be turned into life. And the hell which swallows us into a way to heaven. Therefore, Peter says in 1 Peter 3.21, that we are saved by the water in baptism, which was prefigured by the flood. The water which streams about us, or the plunge into it, is death. And yet from this death or plunge, life results by virtue of the ark of safety, the word of promise to which we cling. The inspired scripture set forth this allegory, which is not only free from weaknesses, but of service in every way and worthy of our careful attention, since it offers wonderful consolation even in the utmost perils. As the flood and the Red Sea were instruments to save Noah and Israel from death, so to us, death is but the instrument to give us life, if we remain in faith. When the children of Israel were in utmost peril, suddenly the sea parted and rose on the right side and on the left like an iron wall, so that Israel passed through without danger. Why was it? in order so that death might be made to serve life. Divine power overcomes the assaults of Satan. Thus, it was in paradise. Satan purposed to slay all mankind by his venom. But what happens? By reason of the truly happy guilt of our first parents, as the church sings, it comes to pass that the Son of God became incarnate, to free us from evil. This allegory then beautifully teaches, strengthens, and consoles us, enabling us to fear neither death nor sin, but to despise all perils, giving thanks to God that he has so called and dealt with us that even death, the universal destroyer, is compelled to be a servant of life, just as the flood. An occasion of destruction to the rest of the world was one of salvation for Noah. And the Red Sea, when Pharaoh met his doom, served to save the children of Israel. I'm reminded of our dear brother Bob. universal destroyer, death, has served him 
to receive life with the Lord. Don't fear these perilous times. Just like the sea in the flood was used to destroy the world, God still saved his remnant. And we, even though we're flooded by all these perilous times in this world, because we are in the ark of the Lord who is Christ, we will be saved. And we will have an eternal resting home, just as our brother Bob has just went to. Glory. Praise God for that. Praise God for that. Allow that to be your anchor in this life. Don't worry about Don't worry about if those who are wicked are prospering here and now. Because they have to worry about what comes in the hereafter the eternal. Yeah. But we, because we're in the ark of our Lord and Savior Jesus yeah. Christ, we don't have to worry. Amen. Once that flood, once the flood waters succeed, paradise will be ours. <laughs> Hallelujah. God knew Jeremiah before he was born and ordained him to his call as a prophet even before he was born. God knows exactly how he will use you. God calls the broken to heal them. As I close, as I close, I want to extend the arms of our church to those who need an ear, a hand, and a blessing in their lives. God works through us. Remember that. Remember that God has empowered His church with His Holy Spirit for a reason. Because He chooses to work through us. He chooses to work through us. That's the life you have been called to. And by us becoming something that we could have never became on our own. God is glorified and he is truly seen as true. We believe that he is because look at what he can do with us, those who are broken. Look how he can heal us. Look how he uses us to help others. So today, if you need help, we are a family here. We are the church. We are brothers and sisters. If you, if you, today, understand that God is calling you, and it's your first time realizing it, we want you. We want you to be encouraged by us to answer that call from the Lord. Put Christ on in baptism. Enter into the ark of the Lord. Be saved. Be redeemed. And start your journey of transformation, becoming one with your brothers and sisters who are waiting. Let us go out and make disciples. Let's proclaim the gospel to the nations. <coughs> Let's remember that that is a hard task, but that burden is light because we're yoked with our Lord Jesus. He's faithful. His love endures. We're about to sing a song. That's why we praise Him. So let's remember these things as we sing. Because of the Lord's goodness, that's why we praise Him. Thank you. He came to live.